If you'd turn in your scriptures with me or it'll come up on the screen. I know last week we had a little difficulty with that. Uh, I goofed up. I read too far. Dan didn't know where my scripture was at because it didn't exist. It wasn't on there. So that was my fault. So you just had to bear with us. We worked through the bugs on that. Uh, but anyway, we're going to look at the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 6 through 9. I will stay with that today. Joshua chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. Now don't get too excited here. Uh, I'm still in the wilderness area, although in the book of Joshua they are in the promised land. They've just come in. They've just went over the Jordan River. Joshua chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. I want to talk about a subject this morning. This is not what I had originally intended on speaking on uh, today. And uh, I come up here Friday to prepare my sermon because we were all gone yesterday. Uh, but I, I just, I got up here and what I originally intended on preaching today, I just, man, I just... It's just one of them deals you just know, man, this is not, it's not working. And uh, so uh, I had something else that I felt like God put on my heart. And I want to talk about, and it's something that I've been kind of dealing with a little bit lately. And I'll explain that a little bit better. Uh, but I want to talk about the wilderness of regret. The wilderness of regret. And the reason, and, and again, I, I think... Let me just give you a little bit of context why I come up, you know, why I feel like this message is on my heart. Uh, I'm almost 50 years old, will be next month. And when you get, and I always thought that, you know, when I was 20, I never thought that I would, I'm 50 so far away. You know, how many of y'all remember feeling like that? I'll never be that old. Now I am. And I talk, and here's what I catch myself doing sometimes. I don't know if anybody else ever does this, but I catch myself talking to 50-year-olds. But I always look at them as like they're 30 years older than I am. Does anybody else ever do that? You know, you always look at them like, man, this is my dad I'm talking to here or something. And, and then I stop and think, I'm as old as they are. Uh, so uh, I think this getting close to 50 maybe is bothering me just a little bit. Uh, I didn't think that it ever would, uh, but I, it makes you think, you know, about your life because, you know, I, what does the Bible say if a man lives to be, what, 72 years old, that he's lived uh, 70, 72, I don't remember the exact number, he's lived a, a full life, and I think, well, I'm only 20 or so years away from that, and, you know, I just think about what have I done, and, and what am I doing, where am I going, where have I been, and and uh, so it, it's just really kind of been on my heart, and I think that that helped me with this message this morning, uh, because I do feel like there's a lot of people living with a lot of regret, and they can't get past it. And because they can't get past it, they will never be able to reach that place where God intends for them to be and where he intends for them to live. And I'm talking about on a spiritual level, and I'm talking about on a useful level, that they can't experience the true power of God because they just can't get past themselves. And I see that, you know, in my own life a little bit, and uh, I, I want us to get past that. I don't want us to stay in that place. I don't want to stay in that place. Uh, I want to take the time that God gives me here on this earth, whether it be many more years or whether it be a few more days or a few more hours, and I want to use them uh, for the glory of God. And I want, to, I want to be able to come down to the end of life and say, you know what, I didn't let some regrets and some things, some failures and some problems, you know, keep me from being what God wanted me to be. So let's look here in Joshua chapter 5, verse 6 through 9. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came up out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto their fathers that they would that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey and their children and, and 
Let me try that again. And their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole or healed. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of this place, of the place, is called Gilgal until this day. If you will, let's pray this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you, God. We just want to thank you for this blessed day. I want to thank you for this people that have come out to uh, hear your word this morning. And I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would help me to be able to preach. And Lord, I pray that this message would be effective. And Lord, if there's anyone else here besides myself that need to hear Lord, about this message, I pray that, God, that you would just bless it and sow it into their hearts and help them to respond to it. And, Lord, help them to leave this place with hope, rejoicing in the Lord, and knowing what you can do in their life. Father, we love you and praise you today, and I just ask for your help to preach now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, again, I just feel like that um, the world, there's so many people in the world, and they're so discouraged with life, and they... They don't really see a lot of purpose in life. And I'm talking about people sitting in church, a lot of, lot of Christians that are sitting in church, and they, they, don't, uh, they don't really see a lot of purpose, and they uh, just feel hopeless. Anybody ever felt that way before? You can be honest about it. I've, I've certainly felt it. Am I the only one? You know, it just, and maybe you haven't experienced that, and I, I hope that you haven't, that you just feel like, man, what's this life all about? You know, what am I doing? And... What have I accomplished? And, and look at the mistakes I've made and the choices that I've made. And, and is, there any, you know, is there any getting through that or getting around that? Or you know, can God still use me or, or do anything with me? Is my life still going to amount to anything? Am I going to be significant? And uh, I think a lot of people in the world are looking for answers like that. They want to know that they're worth something, that they are significant. And I want to say this this morning. How many of all know that that you have been created because you are significant to God. We may not live in a big city and we may not, uh, you know, accomplish monumental things that the world will put in history books and we may not do the things that people say are, are super important, but I want you to understand something. If you are alive and you live on this planet, you are significant to God. And you're significant to others. And so I, I just feel like so many people in today's society really don't have much hope. And uh, so I want to talk about that uh, this morning. I threw this picture back up. You can go back to my picture, Dan, if I won't goof you up too bad. I want you to, if he can get back to that, I want you to take a look. This is the wilderness of Zen. Okay, this is a picture of the wilderness of Zen, if you can see it very well. Uh, this is a different picture than I had up before. But this is where they wandered around for 40 years. There's, no, there's very little water in this place. There's very little vegetation in this place. There's really very little hope in this place. And because of unbelief, they wandered around in this wilderness for 40 years. And I thought about this picture when I pulled it up. I thought, you know... Uh, that really probably is a pretty good description of a lot of people's lives. It's just desolate, and it just seems hopeless, and it seems purposeless, and it just seems like that uh, this is a place that I'm trapped in that I'm never going to get out of. And I am telling you, I feel like a lot of people believe that, and they feel that way. And there's been times that I've lived in this place in my own life to where I thought, man, what am I about? And, and really, is there any significance to me? And am I ever going to do anything more than what I'm doing? Is, and is what I'm doing worth anything? Okay? And uh, so uh, I just want you to think about, you know, this is kind of a depressing picture. That's why I put it up there. And I want you to think about your own life. And is this how you feel about yourself? You know, is this what you think about yourself? And if it is, you can get out of this place. Amen? And uh, we're going to get into the promised land just very, very soon. Uh, maybe even next week we'll move on into that place and, and start, you know, getting a little more upbeat about this deal. Uh, but I want us to uh, look again 
Let's go to the book of Numbers. I know I keep referring to this passage of Scripture. Numbers 14 and verse 40. Before I read that, the Scripture that I had read prior, you know, talked about, and the reason I chose that Scripture over the book of Joshua is because It describes what happened to the children of Israel during that 40 years, that they all died in that wilderness. And I thought, man, that's that's really tough. You know, they had to, don't you know that those people that lived in in the wilderness for 40 years, you see, don't you know they thought we could have had it. We had it in the palm of our hand. We, we had this promised land, and, and we made the wrong choice. We made a bad decision, and because of that, we have stayed in this wilderness for 40 years. And don't you know that they regretted so bad having made that decision? And don't you know that, and, and if I would, I would have to think that if I was one of those people and maybe 30 years down the road, maybe some of them didn't die until that 40th year. Don't you know that they look back over the span of that time and they thought, man, what's it all been about? I've wasted my life here in this wilderness. Now, did God do awesome things for them in the wilderness? He most certainly did. He provided for them in miraculous ways. He, he gave them some victories over some enemies that they would come up against. I mean, he did some awesome things for them in the wilderness. But I think when it come down to the end of it, they probably looked back at the last 40 years and thought, man, what a waste. This is not where God wanted me to be. And I can't help but believe that they lived in a lot of regret. I want us to look here at Numbers 1440, and let's read that. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and will go up unto the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Now here's what happened to the children of Israel, and I know I've read this scripture before, but here's what happened. God tells them, listen, because of your unbelief, you're going to stay in this wilderness for 40 years. And they said, oh no, what have we done? And they, they decide we're going to go up and we're going to conquer, we're going to begin to conquer the land. And God said, don't do it, don't go. But they said, we're going to go because we've messed up, we've made a bad decision. And it didn't work out for them, and God did not allow them to go into that land. So you might say that, you know, well, does that mean that the decisions that I've made, that I've got to live with the consequences all my life and that there's no hope that anything could ever change, that, that I've got to have these regrets for the rest of my life? I'm going to deal with that here in just a minute, but I just want you to understand that there was a point when the children of Israel quickly on knew that they had made a tragic mistake And there was nothing they could do to take it back. Nothing they could do to take it back. The Bible tells us over in the book of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5, which is a a very peculiar passage of Scripture. And if if you're not familiar with it, a few verses up above this, it tells us that we are to help bear one another's burdens. How many of y'all are familiar with that Scripture? And so that word bear one another's burdens in that particular passage of Scripture is talking about bearing each other's moral weaknesses, that I help Jesse with a weakness in his life, and I help him to get past it. I I help him to stay accountable to it, if you will. Then it tells us in this particular verse, if you can see it there, that For every man shall bear his own burden. It sounds like a contradiction. Because just a few verses previous, it says bear one another's burdens. Now it says bear your own burden. What's that talking about? Well, this word bear in this verse is a different word in the Greek. And it means personal responsibility. You see, what it comes down to is this, is I can help Jesse to make the right decision. But I cannot make him make the right decision. That's his personal responsibility. 
And I, I bring this verse up in this passage of Scripture relating to the children of Israel because I want you to understand something. They had to bear the responsibility of their own decision. And the consequence was one of great regret. Okay, they made a decision. They're going to bear the responsibility of that decision. And it is going to bring them great regret. Great regret. Now again, I want you to understand, does that mean I've got to live in regret for the rest of my life, that I can't get out of it, that I've... Listen, I am telling you, there are some decisions that you have made that are, going to, that are going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Does that mean that God can't work through it or work around it? He sure can, and He will, and we'll deal with that at the end of the sermon. But I want to ask you this, what if any are decisions that you have made that you can think of, that you can just speak to yourself about it. Any decisions that you have made that you live in regret of, maybe they were made long ago. Maybe they were made recently, or maybe they were, are being made, and I want to emphasize this, because these are the regrets, these are decisions that you can change the course of Maybe they're being made right now. Maybe you're in the process of making a bad decision right now. And I want you to use this message this morning to maybe decide, you know what, I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to go that direction. I'm going to do different. Okay, I can stop this now and I don't have to regret it later. But maybe your regrets were about decisions made long ago or maybe they were made pretty recent. Perhaps your regrets are the consequences of other people's decisions that were forced upon you. And I know I've talked about this in the past, but, but you know, coming from a, a, you know, a dysfunctional background, I think about some of the regrets, the things that I, I and, and you said, well, they're not personal regrets or nothing that you did. Still yet, I live in the regret that, of decisions that my parents made. Maybe you live in the regrets of decision that your parents have made or that other people have made that, that you now have to live in the consequences of those problems. I want to tell you just a little story uh, one time. And I, 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 I was young, and I don't remember all the details for sure. But I remember one time, not too long after my mom and dad's divorce, and my dad, I, I, I don't know that he was remarried yet, but he was getting close at least. I, I don't remember for sure. But we were going deer hunting one morning. And I, I listen, my dad, I, he loved to hunt. He loved to fish. I loved to hunt. I loved to fish. He loved baseball. I loved baseball. So, I mean, I pretty much, I, I really looked up to my dad. But I was so hurt and so really confused and, 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 and emotionally troubled by my mom and dad's divorce. And I remember one time we were going deer hunting and it was, you know, it was early in the morning. It wasn't daylight yet. And we're driving down the road. I think we were headed somewhere off around competition somewhere. And, and uh, I remember, I don't know what the, how the subject got brought up, but I just began to weep. I was probably about 14 years old. And I, I just began to weep, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said, why? Something along that line, why? Why did you guys have to do this? Why did you have to make that decision? And again, I don't know exactly, I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, but I just remember weeping in the truck. And I thought, and I thought about this Friday when I was putting this sermon together, I thought, you know, I've, I've lived in some regrets. But I didn't, on decisions I didn't make. You know, there's a lot of people that's maybe living in, dis, you know, regrets of, you know, emotional regrets, thinking about what could have been. I guess that's what I mean by regrets, is I think about what could have been. What could have been if they had stayed together? And I regret that, not knowing that, not ever having the opportunity to know that. A lot of people living regret, maybe they were, you know, and, and my, my, my life was nothing compared to what some people face. People that were abused, people that were forsaken, people that were neglected, people that, you know, whatever you want to say there. One of my decisions 
But I live with some of the regrets of those decisions that others made. And that's what I mean by that. Maybe your regrets are because, and I want to spend just a few minutes here, but maybe your regrets are because you married the wrong person. Well, what do you do with that, right? I hope nobody's in that boat, but listen, I'm telling you, there are people that have married the wrong person and wake up some, one day and think, man, I regret not having waited. Now, can God redeem that? Absolutely, he does, he will, because I'm going to tell you something about marriage. Marriage is sacred. Marriage, was, marriage is created by God. When we say, I do, and we consummate that marriage, that person is your flesh and your bone amen they become part of your life and even if you wake up one day and say you know what i think i messed up you better make it you better figure out how to make it work amen but the reason i bring that up and it's such a hard issue to talk about because i can talk to you young people just for a minute because i'm going to tell you something the way that the world talks about how that we find a mate is not necessarily God's way of doing things. I want you boys, I want you young girls, I want you young men, you young ladies, I want you to listen to me for just a minute. Be careful about this dating thing. Running from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. Because what you're going to end up doing, if you are not very careful, is you're, going to, you're not going to wait around for God to bring the right person across your path. And you're going you're gonna to do, date and you're going to do things the world's way and you may wake up someday thinking, what have I done? Now I have to live with that decision. So you young people, listen to me. Be careful. Do things God's way. Let God bring the person for you into your life. Don't try to do his work for him. Amen? So what the children of Israel tried to do didn't work out. They lived in a lifelong regret. Maybe you've made a decision to, and, and this affects so many people, but maybe you've made a decision to divorce. And you regret that. I don't know that hardly anybody ever gets a divorce and doesn't regret some of the decisions that, that were made to make that happen or some of the decisions that led up to that point in their life. You know, they, they regret what that done to them, and they regret what it done to the other people in their families, such as their kids and so on. Maybe you've made a decision at some point in your life to be unfaithful to your spouse. And you regret that decision that you made to do that. I don't know what that would be like. I've never experienced that, of course, but I can only imagine that one day you get caught or one day you wake up and you realize, what have I done? You can't take that back. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? You can't take that back. Once you, and, and divorce, you think about divorce, especially if you divorce and remarry, you think, man, I can't go back. I can't take this back. And you marry the wrong person. I can't take it back. Maybe you have regrets on how you raised your kids. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. What I have learned is once my kids are grown, they're grown. I can't take that back. What I have taught them, how I have trained them, what the person that I have helped mold them into is the person that they are, and I can't go back and change that. Maybe you live in regret of the time that you spent. Maybe you have a regret of the first time that you tried alcohol or the first time that you tried drugs. You can't ever take that back, and it led you down a path that you never thought you would go on. Maybe you regret the choice that you made to run with some friends. And I want to talk to you young people again. Be careful about your friends. Be careful who you run with. Be careful about the influence that they bring into your life. Because I'm telling you, one day you may look back 20 years from now and say, man, I wish I had never went 
on that one thing that has altered the course of my life. Many adults could be honest enough, if they would be honest enough, honest enough to say, would say, you know what, I wish I'd have never made that one choice. Now, I mean, the list could go on and on about regrets, but we're going to stop right there and keep moving forward. Maybe you're in that place of life where you're beginning to look back and wonder what it's all been about. That's kind of where I've been here lately. Bridget knows this, and I just want to share it with you a little bit. As a pastor, as a preacher, I don't know that any pastor that's, and I say this, and I don't mean this judgmentally because I don't know how other pastors feel necessarily, but I don't think any pastor is worth his salt would ever say, you know what, uh, I just, I'm satisfied with where I'm at. I don't want things to grow, and I don't want the church to get, you know, bigger. I don't want to preach to bigger crowds. I'm listen. I would love to be able to stand in front of an audience of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people. I, it would just be the most awesome experience. And I uh, had a little spell here lately, and again, I think my age is kind of catching up with me just a little bit. And, and I thought, you know, if, I, I told Bridget the other day, I said, I just want to be significant. I'm talking about as a, as a pastor, as a preacher. I want to I be significant. And then the next day, and I didn't tell her about this part, the next day God said, hey, man. That's how God talks to me. No, not really. <laughs> he said, hey, those people down there are significant. I love them. Their lives mean something to me. You're, and you know what he was saying? Quit feeling sorry for yourself and thinking you're insignificant when all those people that come to church on Sunday, they are significant. So what if it ain't some mega church? So what if it ain't got thousands of people attending it? I love those people and they're significant to me. And you're, you're part of their life. So I just say, maybe you're in that weird place in life where you think, man, what's it all been about? Listen, has my life, again, been one of significance, or have I just lived for myself and my stuff? Maybe you ask that question. Maybe you're at this place in life, and you say, have I, has my life been one of significance? But now I look back, and I'm older, and I think, man, all I've ever really lived for is myself. Where I could go, what I could do, what I could get, my stuff that don't mean much to me now because I'm going to die and it's all going to be left behind and it's going to be distributed out to other people. Is that all my life has amounted to? Maybe you're in that place to where you think, you know, I just have so many regrets that I've not lived for others and I've not lived a life of greater significance by serving other people. Because I'm going to tell you something about significance Significance will never be obtained until you learn to serve others. Amen? That's just the truth. And I want to ask you this question as we get close to the end of this message. Is there any hope for redemption? Or must I, like the children of Israel, die in this wilderness? And this wilderness we're talking about this morning in particular is regret. Is there any hope? Well, I want to tell you something. There is hope. There is hope. Let's look at Joshua chapter 5 and verse 9 and read it again. Joshua 5, 9. Joshua 5, 9 says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day, have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you? Wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. So I want you to understand what God is saying. Now you say, well, that's God talking about the, the next generation that come up. The other generation died in the wilderness. I want you to understand, it gives us a picture of redemption. It gives us a picture of restoration. It gives us a picture that God took what they had made as a bad decision and he worked through it and he, he made it good. Now I know this, you don't have to stay in this wilderness. 
You are going to have to live with some of the consequences of your decisions. Maybe sometimes that is true. You can't take them back. But I want you to know that our God is a God of redemption. He is a God of restoration. Amen? I want you to go back if you want an example of this. Even in the beginning when Adam made the most regrettable decision ever made. The most regrettable decision ever made. A decision that would impact all of humanity for all of, all of human time. God sent, listen, that's what man did. He made the most regrettable decision that could ever be made. He made the decision to disobey God. And that decision would affect all of humanity from then even till now. But God sent another man, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through him that you and I today can have something the children of Israel did not have in the wilderness of Zen, and that is we have grace. Amen? That God sent, even through the worst decision ever made, God says, I can work around that, I can work through that, and I will bring another man into the world. His name is Jesus. He is my son. He will die for their sins, and he will bring forgiveness and restoration. You see, we don't have to stay and die in the wilderness like the children of Israel because we have something that they did not have. And that is redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, here's the thing. I may have to live with some of the consequences of my decisions but I want you to know that I can be free from the guilt of the regret. I can be free from the guilt of the regret. And I want to go a step further than this and say that not only can I be free from the guilt of the regret, but God says that I can take that bad decision you made and I can turn that thing around and I can make it work for good. Amen? I'm going to tell you this about on a personal level. Had it not been for my mom and dad's divorce, not that it was right, not that, but I'm not trying to justify it, but I am telling you this, it may be that I would not be here today had it not been for that. What am I saying? I'm saying God took a bad situation, turned it around by his grace, and made something good out of it. We can be free from the guilt of the regret and begin to walk. Listen, we can begin to walk in the promised land of forgiveness. A land where the Lord, in Psalms 23, verse 1 through 3, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. We can begin to walk in the promised land of forgiveness, a land where the Lord is our shepherd where he will cause us to lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still or peaceful waters. For he restores our soul. Amen? Listen, God wants you to walk in that promised land. He wants you to be able to lay those regrets down. He wants you to be able to lie in his green pasture. What does that give us a picture of? It gives us a picture of safety. It gives us a picture of forgiveness. It gives us a picture of peace. Amen? Oh, how the world needs peace. Oh, how the troubled soul needs peace. To be able to lie down in God's safety beside His peaceful waters where He restores us into the person that He intends for us to be. If you'd please stand with me this morning.